Hello, I'm Alma Angeles. We're moving to the next stage of the pandemic, and as the world resets to the new normal, we find ourselves seeking the right balance between health and livelihood, constantly adjusting the boundaries between liberty and responsibility. Here are tonight's news. The United States recorded 63,643 new coronavirus cases according to a tracker maintained by Johns Hopkins University. As of 8.30 p.m., 774 people died of COVID-19 in the country in the past 24 hours, the Baltimore-based university said. The worst-hit country in the world by the pandemic, the U.S. has recorded a total of 133,969 deaths out of 3.18 million cases. In recent days, Texas and Florida reported record numbers of virus deaths. The World Health Organization has updated its guidelines on what may be a key factor in the spread of the coronavirus disease, aerosol transmission. The health body said aerosol spread cannot be ruled out. It also called for continued use of safety measures like face masks when physical distancing cannot be maintained. Take a look. Um, there is the possibility that there could be aerosol, aerosolized particles in specific settings like indoor settings where there are crowded conditions, um, where there's poor ventilation, and where people are spending prolonged periods of time. And so what we've seen is that there are some outbreaks that have been reported in these closed indoor settings with poor ventilation, um, which include what you had mentioned, the nightclubs, which have uh, included choirs, uh, fitness centers, where airborne transmission could, cannot be ruled out. Uh, in those outbreaks, there could also be the droplet transmission and fomite, the contaminated surface transmissions. We recommend a comprehensive set of packages which include physical distancing, which does include hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, which includes the use of fabric masks when you cannot do physical distancing, um, and it, to, to ensure that when you have these closed settings that you have good ventilation. So it's a combination of packages. An international group of 239 scientists said that as countries ease their lockdowns, authorities need to recognize the coronavirus can spread through the air far beyond the two meters or six feet urged in social distancing guidelines. In a comment piece that takes direct aim at the World Health Organization for its reluctance to update its advice, researchers recommended new measures, including increasing indoor ventilation, installing high-grade air filters and UV lamps and preventing overcrowding in buildings and transport. Now, the authors, led by Lydia Morawska of the Queensland University of Technology, wrote that there's significant potential for inhalation exposure to viruses in microscopic respiratory droplets or micro droplets at short to medium distances up to several meters or room scale. When an infected person breathes, speaks, coughs, or sneezes, they expel droplets of various sizes. And those above 5 to 10 micrometers, which is less than the width of a typical human head hair, fall to the ground in seconds and within a meter or two. Droplets under this size can become suspended in the air in what is called an aerosol, remaining aloft or aloft for several hours and uh, traveling up to tens of meters. The new paper appears in the Oxford Ac Academic Journal Clinical Infectious Diseases. In other news, California will release up to 8,000 more prisoners to reduce the spread of the coronavirus in its crowded jails. According to authorities in the U.S. state, one of the hardest hit by the pandemic. The announcement, welcomed by prison reform advocates, follows a surge in COVID-19 cases in one of California's oldest prisons, the San Quentin. State Governor Gavin Newsom said the outbreak there was a deep area of focus and concern after more than 1,000 inmates tested positive. Let's listen in. We currently have 2,445 prisoners at CDCR that have tested positive for COVID-19, a prison population uh, north of 110, 120 ish thousand. Rightly, though, have pinpointed the area of top concern, though not the only concern. 
uh, in the system, and that is San Quentin, 1,388 individuals uh, that have tested positive inmates uh, in that prison. The California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation said the inmates could be eligible for early release by the end of August, joining 10,000 prisoners already freed in similar initiatives since the start of the virus crisis. The San Quentin facility this week made up half of the active coronavirus virus cases in jails throughout the state, which has a total prison population of about 113,000. Friday's statement said the prisoners to be freed, who include inmates from San Quentin, would be tested for COVID-19 within a week of their release. California, the most populated U.S. state with a population of around 40 million, has confirmed more than 300,000 coronavirus cases and over 6,800 deaths from the disease. Meanwhile, President Donald Trump on Friday commuted the prison sentence of his longtime ally, Roger Stone, shielding the veteran Republican operative from 40 months behind bars. Roger Stone is now a free man, the White House said in a statement, days before he was to report to a federal prison to start serving his term. Stone, one of Trump's oldest confidants, was convicted last November of lying to Congress, tampering with a witness and obstructing the House investigation into whether the Trump campaign conspired with Russia to cheat in the 2016 election. The World Health Organization has urged countries grappling with the coronavirus to step up control measures, saying it's still possible to rein it in, as some nations clamp fresh restrictions on citizens. With case numbers worldwide more than doubling in the past six weeks, Uzbekistan on Friday returned to lockdown. Other countries like Hong Kong said it would, uh, that schools would close from Monday after the city recorded exponential growth in locally transmitted infections. Here's more. Uh, it was to be expected, and I think we and many other scientists uh, around the world have said that once lockdowns uh, were, were ended, that there was always the risk that the disease could bounce back because if the virus is present, it will uh, potentially take all opportunities to transmit. Uh, our advice has been, I think, uh, quite consistent in advising countries, number one, to open up slowly in a stepwise uh, fashion, to wait between different phases of reopening, to ensure that the data on the virus is clean and clear and tells you where your problems are, to be ready to move backwards or forwards depending on what that data is telling you, and to accept the fact that in our current situation, uh, it is very unlikely that we can eradicate or eliminate this virus. There are very particular environments in which that can occur, island states and other places, but even they risk re-importation. And we've seen countries who've managed to get to zero or almost zero re-import virus from outside. So there's always a risk, either from within or from bringing disease back in. Uh, and therefore, it is a given that there is always a risk of further cases. Uh, the transmission that occurs in that situation uh, can be single sporadic cases, which can be relatively easily isolated and quarantined. A more worrying pattern is large clusters of cases that could occur in association with super spreading events, events in which there are large crowds gather, the virus is present and you get a small explosion of cases, which can very quickly um, mushroom into a much larger case. It's, it's very analogous to a, to a, to a forest fire. Uh, a small fire uh, is hard to see, but it's easy to put out. Uh, a large fire is hard to see, or easy to see, but very difficult to put out. So you really need a system where you can detect the small flames, the small embers that may be there. You can detect a small fire and put that out by good surveillance, by good detection, by aggressive testing, and then by isolating cases, quarantining cases. Throughout all of this, and I think this is probably very central message that when the virus is present, there is a risk of spread. The authorities can have surveillance in place. The authorities need to have that in place, isolation, quarantine, all of those other measures and testing. But ultimately, it comes down to communities and individuals and how we protect ourselves and how we protect others. When the virus is in your community, uh, the guy, it, it is quite clear that... 
The health agency's comments came as U.S. President Trump was forced to cancel an election rally in New Hampshire, citing an approaching storm. More than 12.3 million cases have been registered in 196 countries and territories, triggering massive economic damage. The U.S., the country's worst hit by the illness, reported almost 64,000 new cases Friday, and the death toll now stands at just under 134,000, according to Johns Hopkins University. Meanwhile, Brazil surpassed 70,000 coronavirus deaths on Friday, the health ministry said, though the number of daily fatalities appears to be stabilizing. The ministry said there had been 45,000 new infections and 1,200 deaths over the last 24 hours, taking the totals to 1.8 million cases and 70,400 deaths. Brazil, a country of 212 million, is the second worst affected country in the world after the United States. The number of deaths has doubled over the last 35 days, with Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro states the worst hit, respectively reporting 17,400 and 11,200 deaths. Meanwhile, Brazil's President Jair Bolsonaro assured that he feels very good and is campaigning once again for the use of hydroxychloroquine, an anti-malarial drug whose effectiveness against coronavirus is not scientifically proven and that keeps dividing the global scientific community. In the U.S., the National Institutes of Health in June stopped a clinical trial of hydroxychloroquine, saying the drug didn't work and that the Food and Drug administration issued a warning in May explaining that the medication can cause dangerous abnormalities in the heart rhythm of coronavirus patients. Meanwhile, Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in the U.S., says that he is cautiously optimistic that we will get a safe and effective vaccine, that there will be multiple candidates using multiple platforms. As he speaks, at an IAS virtual conference. Take a look. It seemed that whatever we did in different parts of the world, there were responses that were sometimes favorable in that countries got it under control. But as you can see from this slide here, my own country, the United States, as I'm sure we'll be able to discuss a little bit more, is in the middle right now, even as we speak, in a very serious problem. That if we're going to get a vaccine, which I am cautiously optimistic that we will get a safe and effective vaccine, that there will be multiple candidates using multiple platforms. I think we're going to need that, Chris, because we have a responsibility to the entire planet, not just to the individual country. The approach that we are taking in the United States and various approaches throughout the world is what we call a strategic approach because we know we have multiple candidates that are being tested in the United States and certainly elsewhere to try and get a harmonization of protocols to ask the same question with a common DSMB, common immunological parameters, and common primary and secondary endpoints. And finally, this last slide just gives you a, 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 an idea of the landscape of the multiple different platforms that are being pursued and where they are in various stages of phases of trials. As many of you know, this summer, several will be starting to go into a phase three trial, some within the next several weeks, some in the middle and the end of the summer, and even in other countries, some have already started. Meanwhile, philanthropist and founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates, called for any future COVID-19 vaccine to be distributed based on equity, warning that selling drugs to the highest bidder would lead to a longer and more in just deadlier pandemic. In the global race to detect, treat, and vaccinate against COVID-19, researchers are making great advances. Faster, better diagnostic tools are being developed to help identify those infected. Investments are being made in libraries of antiviral drugs, which has been an underinvested branch of science. Also, we're making great progress on vaccines. These platforms won't just be useful against this particular virus. They will also help us specifically 
for HIV. If we just let drugs and vaccines go to the highest bidders instead of to the people and the places where they're most needed, we'll have a longer, more unjust, deadlier pandemic. We need leaders to make these hard decisions about distributing based on equity, not just on market-driven factors. So whether it's AIDS or COVID-19, global cooperation, a resolve to invent the tools and get them out where they're needed most is critical. When we have those things, nations, institutions, and advocates working together on this collective response, we do see remarkable impact. Meanwhile, United Nations Chief Antonio Guterres said any future coronavirus vaccine must be available to everyone. The COVID-19 crisis is a wake-up call. Economies and societies must be reshaped to be fairer and more inclusive. Effective treatment and the future vaccine against the coronavirus must be available to everyone everywhere as a global public good, a people's vaccine. Above all, we need a recovery based on economic and social justice since response gaps in pandemics, whether HIV or COVID-19, lie along the fault lines of inequality and political choices. France's coronavirus death toll has exceeded 30,000 after the country logged 25 fatalities since Thursday, according to health authorities. The news came as health officials warned of a rising trend in cases in metropolitan France and urged the public to be vigilant. Given the possibility of a second wave of the epidemic, France has the sixth highest number of fatalities in the global pandemic after the U.S., Brazil, Britain, Italy and Mexico. However, the number of French cases in intensive care continues to fall, standing at 496 Friday evening, down 16 on Thursday. A French bus driver who was badly beaten by passengers after asking them to wear face masks in line with coronavirus rules has died, according to his family, sparking tributes from political leaders who condemned his cowardly attackers. Philippe Mongolio, 59, was left brain dead by the attack in the southwestern town of Bayonne last weekend and died in hospital on Friday. Two men have been charged with attempted murder over the attack and Prosecutor Jerome Bourrier told AFP that he would ask for the charges to be upgraded following the death. Now, Mongolio's family had organized a silent march in his honor on Wednesday, departing from the bus stop where the assault took place. His colleagues refused to work after the attack, but will resume work on Monday under stepped-up security arrangements, according to local operator Keolis. Now, this will include security agents being deployed on the long buses that operate in Bayonne and its surrounding area. Three other people have been charged in connection with the attack, two for failing to assist a person in danger and another for attempting to hide a suspect according to the prosecutor's office. The two charged with attempted murder are aged 22 and 23 and were previously known to police. Eagle News will be right back. Welcome back. Japanese baseball fans shrugged off a record spike in coronavirus cases in Tokyo as they flocked back to stadiums for the first time in months. Take a look.
もうあのコロナ対策はちゃんとした上で、試合をやるんだろうなっていうことは、これまでの,あの経緯を見てて分かったので、特にあの今日来ることに関しては抵抗はなかったので。And rescue workers are searching for missing people in Fukuhama Kumamoto Prefecture after heavy rains and flooding devastated the region. The disaster has killed at least 60 people with more missing in the prefecture alone. The death toll has climbed gradually as more victims are being discovered in isolated areas. In many areas, landslides reduced houses to rubble and flood water rushed into homes in low-lying areas, destroying the contents and rendering them uninhabitable. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said that around 130,000 rescue workers and troops were battling to save lives, complicating the rescue efforts. The coronavirus epidemic has claimed nearly 1,000 lives in Japan from more than 20,000 cases. And the need to maintain social distancing has reduced capacity at shelters and many have preferred to take refuge in their vehicles for fear of becoming infected. Now, according to a study, patients with abnormally high blood sugar levels are more than twice as likely to die from COVID-19, according to from researchers in China. It is the first time scientists have been able to confirm that patients with hyperglycemia but not diagnosed with diabetes are at higher risk of death from COVID-19 and they wrote this in the journal Diabetologia. Now, the researchers examined death rates for 605 COVID-19 patients at two hospitals in Wuhan, China. Having high blood pressure is independently associated with increased risk of death and complications from COVID-19, they wrote. Now, the study builds on previous research on diabetic patients. One in 10 COVID-19 patients with diabetes died in French hospitals, a far higher proportion than for patients without the condition. Now, exactly why high blood sugar increases COVID-19 death rates remains unclear. The authors of Friday's study suggested that blood clotting, the weakening of blood vessel linings, and cytokine storm syndrome, an overreaction of the immune system, could all play a role. In other news, Stephen Cameron, the British pilot who spent more than two months or on life support in Vietnam after contracting COVID-19, was on his way home Saturday, astounding doctors who gave him just 10% chance of survival earlier. As soon as I get fit, I'm coming back. Um, I've been overwhelmed by the um, by the, the generosity of the Vietnamese people, yeah. the dedication and professionalism of the doctors and nurses, both here at the um, Chow Ray and at the uh, Tropical Disease Hospital. The odds say that I shouldn't be here, so I can only thank everybody here for yeah. doing what they've done. Uh, and I go, I go, go home with a happy heart because I'm going home, yeah. but like a sad one because I'm leaving so many people here that I've made friends with. Yeah. So, um, coming back. Yeah. It's a wee, it's a wee. Stephen Cameron, 42 years old, was the sickest patient medics have had to treat during the coronavirus outbreak in Vietnam, which has recorded no official deaths following a fast and aggressive response to the pandemic. Just a few weeks after arriving in Vietnam in early February for a new role with the national carrier, Cameron spent an evening at the popular Buddha Bar in Ho Chi Minh City. He tested positive days later on March 18 for COVID-19. Known as patient 91, Cameron became the focus of huge media attention as the country's top medical minds met to brainstorm treatment options. Little more than six weeks ago, they warned that Cameron would need a double transplant for his lungs, which were only functioning at around 10%. 
But after nearly four months in hospitals in Ho Chi Minh City, including 10 weeks on a ventilator, the Vietnam Airlines pilot from Motherwell, Scotland, was discharged on Saturday and was due to fly back to the UK within hours. Every step towards recovery made headlines. Finally, Saturday, as state media said, his treatment bill had reached at least $150,000. He was well enough to catch a special repatriation flight to London, accompanied by three doctors, according to state media. Now, his return home comes as Vietnam celebrated 85 days with no community transmission of the coronavirus. The country has just 370 virus confirmed cases and zero deaths, but its borders remain largely shut. More than 10,000 people are currently in mandatory quarantine. Eagle News will be right back. Emirates Airline has cut a tenth of its workforce during the novel coronavirus pandemic in layoffs that could rise to 15 percent or 9,000 jobs, according to its president, according to a report on Saturday. Now, the Middle East's largest carrier, which operates a fleet of 270 wide-bodied aircraft, stopped operations in late March as part of global shutdowns to stem the spread of the virus. It resumed two weeks later on a limited network and plans to fly to 58 cities by mid-August, down from about 157 before the crisis. However, its president, Tim Clark, has said previously that it could take up to four years for operations to return to some degree of normality and that the airline has been staging rounds of layoffs as recently as last week without disclosing numbers. Now, before the crisis hit, Emirates employed some 60,000 staff, including 4,300 pilots and nearly 22,000 cabin crew, according to its annual report. Meanwhile, AirAsia boss Tony Fernandez insists that the top budget carrier would emerge stronger from the coronavirus pandemic despite a warning about its future and said that the airline was hopeful of raising a sizable cash injection. Fernandez said the, cor the coronavirus was by far the toughest challenge AirAsia had ever faced, but he also sought to strike a positive note. Let's listen in. You know, I, I never would have believed the aviation industry could be hit this hard. But, uh, you know, we're still standing, uh, we're still flying, we still have good load factors. And so, you know, this won't go on forever. And uh, I think we'll come out stronger and, you know, we're not wasting this crisis, we're taking opportunities. Process, but we've been looking at about 7.5% across the group. 7.5%? Mm. We hope that's it. but. We can't predict exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll have to do what we have to do to save this airline. It's the worst thing in the world to do. We hope to raise more than one billion. And uh, excluding asset sales, etc. So, you know, the two billion figure is a, is, a, is, a, is a number that we're targeting over a period of uh, six months. Right. The fact is, after two months, we're 50% of where we were pre-COVID in domestic. So business can come back much quicker. I mean, I think long haul international travel is going to take a while. Flying is not going to disappear. And uh, if anything, airfares are going to go up a little bit, but not, not to a crazy level for us to kill demand, but enable us to to have a very good margin because pricing is now uh, much more reasonable. On Monday, the AirAsia reported a record quarterly loss of 803 million ringgit or 187 million US dollars for the first three months of the year after being forced to ground its fleet due to the virus. Auditor Ernst Young said that global travel restrictions had dented AirAsia's financial performance with liabilities exceeding assets by 1.84 billion ringgit. The company is just recovering from a crisis it faced earlier this year when 
President Fernandez stepped aside as authorities probed unusual payments at the airline as part of a $4 billion graft scandal involving European plane maker Airbus. Now he returned to his post in March after being cleared by an independent investigation. The flamboyant Fernandez has carved an image for himself as Asia's answer to Richard Branson, shaking up Southeast Asian air travel with his carrier slogan, Now Everyone Can Fly. He hasn't been shy in flaunting his wealth and is the co-owner of London football club, Queen's Park Rangers. When mixed martial arts supremo Dana White first floated his Fight Island concept with its echoes of the Bruce Lee blockbuster Enter the Dragon, where fighters were drawn into combat at a private getaway, eyebrows were raised. Now, mixed martial arts supremo Dana White's vision will be unveiled on Sunday with the staging of the 13th Fight UFC 251 event on Abu Dhabi's Yas Island. The event will be headlined by a welterweight world title encounter between the Nigerian-American champion Kamaru Usman and Cuban-American challenger Jorge Masvidal. It's one of four one of four Fight Island cards to be staged without an audience inside an arena on the resort and entertainment island throughout July, kicking off with three world title bouts and a title challenge eliminator. Usman said during a virtual media event that he had been impressed by what he had seen since arriving in the United Arab Emirates on Thursday. He said, I'm grateful for everything that's been done. And uh, said Usman, gunning for the second defense of his title, all the precautions he said have been taken. And he said, after I go out there on Saturday and get my hand raised, I'll be glad to be heading home COVID-free. The UFC has made the move to Abu Dhabi from its Las Vegas base in an effort to isolate its fighters during the coronavirus pandemic. Safety has been a major motivator, as has the promoters need to keep staging events and collecting revenue during a crisis that has shut down or forced massive overhauls to the staging of the world's major sporting events. Strict lockdown measures have been imposed on athletes, their entourages, officials, staff and media for the duration of their stay on Yas Island on a site that has been completely sealed off until the event concludes on July 26. And NBA players have arrived in Orlando to face life in the league's bubble at Walt Disney World ahead of the start of the training camp workouts. Take a look. Players are tested for coronavirus upon arrival at the quarantine zone designed to prevent outbreaks, even as Florida becomes one of the latest U.S. epicenters of the deadly virus. They must pass another test at least 24 hours later to leave isolation and then partake of hotel restaurants with more than pre-packaged offerings. Teams can begin training camp workouts once they've completed bubble arrival quarantine. Teams will start to scrimmage each other on July 22 ahead of the planned July 30 restart. Some players have been outspoken in their lack of confidence in the NBA bubble plan which was assembled in consultation with the players' union and medical experts, as well as local and state officials. I don't like the idea, Philadelphia 76ers star Joel Embiid said. I still don't believe in it, and I don't think it's going to be safe enough. The Cameroonian center said he considered not playing, but did not want to let down his teammates as they tried to capture an NBA title. Embiid had little confidence every player on every team would follow all of the restrictions needed to safeguard everyone in the bubble environment for the virus. Portland's Damian Lillard expressed similar feelings last weekend. In other news, the summer race to land a space probe on Mars is off to a, hard, to a hot start. Take a look. In 2020, three missions will take advantage of an ideal Earth-Mars configuration to explore the Red Planet. Launch date from Cape Canaveral, July 2020. The U.S. mission, Mars 2020, aims to land a rover vehicle on the planet's surface. Once it has arrived in February 2021, NASA's Perseverance will explore the site known as the J-Zero Crater, formerly a lake in 
search of signs of ancient life. Around 40 rock and soil samples will be collected and placed in tubes ready to be brought back to Earth by a later mission. The first Chinese mission to Mars is due in the same period. A Long March 5 rocket will take off from the tropical island of Hainan. Called Tan Wen or Questions to Heaven, the mission has three arms. Place a probe in orbit around Mars, land on the surface, and then release a remote guided robotic rover to conduct analysis. In mid-July, the United Arab Emirates is set to launch Al-Amal, which means hope in Arabic, from Tanegishima in Japan, part of celebrations to mark the country's 50th anniversary in 2021. The first Arab mission will study Mars' atmosphere. To do this, it will be equipped with an infrared spectrometer to measure the planet's lower atmosphere, a high-resolution imager to provide information about the ozone, and an ultraviolet spectrometer to measure oxygen and hydrogen levels. Now, an animation based on images taken by the ESA's Mars Express showcases the 82-kilometer uh, wide Karolev crater on Mars, located in the northern lowlands of the Red Planet, south of the large Olympia Yunde Dune field that partly surrounds Mars' north polar cap. This well-preserved impact crater is filled with water ice all year round, and the crater's floor lies two kilometers below its rim, enclosing a 1.8-kilometer-thick kilometer dome deposit that represents a large reservoir on non-polar ice on Mars. Take a look. In time of physical and emotional distance, we give importance to the unsung service delivered by our frontliners, our news correspondents positioned all over the world. Without them, we would not have the eagle eye focus on the facts of this pandemic and its continuing repercussions in our lives. To our international correspondents, thank you for staying in touch with our viewers. Stay safe, protect yourselves and others. Good night, I'm Alma Angeles. We live in interesting times.